Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 31 of the Mind Blown Zone. This one is called An Empowering Creation Story. This is perhaps an alternative to the typical creation stories in society, which would be the Big Bang story and the biblical story. So Brad's going to be presenting this. How you doing, Brad? I am never better. How about yourself? Ah, uh, pretty good. Uh, one and a half coffees deep. So just feeling it, man. Awesome. Let's let her rip then. What's this uh, little script here have to say? All right. Let me read the juicy teaser. Almost everybody is aware of the ideas surrounding mainstream stories about our origins. The materialist point of view revolves around its Big Bang theory of cosmology with its ensuing emergent consciousness phenomenon, formation of life and evolution, while the Christian story revolves around scripture and Genesis with God creating all that we see culminating with the story of Adam and Eve. Whereas the esoteric story contains a few elements of both, suggesting how mixing truth and lies can prove to be an effective form of persuasion. The primary goal in this podcast is to point out the many assumptions and beliefs in the mainstream in the mainstream stories, followed by sharing what will be a new creation story to many that leads to empowerment. Awesome. That sounds pretty juicy. Well, why don't you let's, take it away, Brad? Let's let her rip. So, yeah, I, and I wanted to start this off with just a, a couple definitions. I, you know, hopefully more and more people are coming to, uh, uh, you know, a more accurate sense of the definition of the word reincarnation. I've had a few many dozen awkward conversations around what that meant to people. And, you know, it means a lot of different things, uh, including if you're bad in this lifetime, you could be a slug in the next lifetime. Or I've heard had other people tell me that they thought it meant that you just keep coming back as the same person over and over again. And that didn't make any sense because you, why don't you remember? Uh, and so I wanted to just briefly suggest that the reincarnation idea Technically, there's there's a couple different levels of looking at it, and perhaps I'll say at the highest level, it is not true in the sense that we have come to think of things, but from the level of consciousness that almost all human beings are at today, uh, that there is uh, the the definition would suggest that when we when when our body uh, is laid down, the soul of course exits and eventually comes back in another body with no memories of any previous lifetimes. So that's the, that's the way I'm going to be speaking of that uh, in this podcast, uh, not the other two ideas. Uh, just to be clear, uh, I'm pretty well convinced that uh, as you, you don't go backwards in consciousness. Uh, so you can't be a slug is a, you know, lower form of, you know, the animal kingdom. And so there's several uh, alleged deviate or alleged, uh, uh, evolutions from us from a slug all the way to basically a domesticated pet before you could get to be a human according to uh, the sources that i read so once you become a human you don't go backwards so i wanted to make that clear uh any uh any and questions if i can on ask that? a question it would be okay so let's say you die in 2041 does that mean you come back the next day or in 2042 or something or is it could be hundreds of years later or can you even come back in the year 300 bc or what, what's a, the theory on that that's a super deep question and and the answer is all of the above from what i've so it could be any time yes from what i understand normally it it is it comes in a linear fashion with some time between incarnations i think that's the normal way it works so there's a period of processing uh, readjusting, uh, and then re-entering the physical domain. And of course, a nine month gestation period and so forth. So that's, that's the normal, uh, thing that happens, but depending on the length of processing, the length of difficulties, the inability to come to grips with certain things that that can extend for many, many, many years or decades before the, that soul is ready to give it another go. Okay, fine. And going backwards in time is unusual from what I understand, but it it's not impossible. 
So whether or not that's true, all we could ever do is believe one thing or the other. So it doesn't matter too much. But the, you know, the reincarnation idea is obviously common and prevalent. And I'll talk about this a little bit later, but obviously in Eastern, you know, the Eastern religions, Buddhism, the Hindu traditions and so forth. So big percentage of the world's population uh, believes in this idea. Uh, so that's one. The other word is karma. I want to make sure that everybody gets that because, you know, this one too is tricky and I don't want to get too deep in it. But the, the simple idea behind karma is what, what goes around comes around. So the energy that you put out must come back to you. And, you know, whether that's in this lifetime or the next, that's the hard thing for people to process is, is the idea that you could do something horrible in this lifetime or something wonderful in this lifetime and not get the return energetic uh, echo, uh, but it, it comes back to you in a following lifetime. So that's karma. And, you know, you see that just for people who are Christians in the Bible, you know, it's uh, as you sow, so shall you reap is karma. And perhaps one last little tidbit about this is karmic retribution or blessings, depending on what what's coming from you, uh, are equal in terms of thoughts or actions. So while uh, an action is just the result of many, many, many successive thoughts along the same line, that eventually leads to an action. Uh, the uh, this thinking terrible things about other people also has the karmic bounce back. Any questions about that? Do you mean that uh, the bounce back of the thoughts is that other people will think them about you or you'll think them about yourself? Both and more potentially. Okay. You could you could never attribute it to, oh yeah, I, I was thinking negative about this, you know, celebrity and and then, you know, this celebrity, you know, tagged me and said something nasty about me, right? You, you'll never be able to connect the dots. If if it was that easy, then everybody would totally get it. So it's never okay. clear how it comes back, when it comes back. Let's just say negativity out, negativity back. Mm -hmm. And, and I like this way of putting it because it even with from a scientific point of view, even have Newton's third law, a reaction has an equal and opposite reaction. So in Precise. a closed system, <laughs> from that perspective, well, there you go. That's, that's exactly that's right. right. There. Exactly right. You And it, it is a closed system and, and it's, you are the originator or the creator of the energy. So you have to resolve it. Right. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, suffer the, the consequences. So the, the, you know, reasons why we don't understand this and why this is debatable and unclear is a, is a whole different conversation. It's a whole different podcast we could have sometime. But I just wanted to make those words clear. I'll probably say them both a few times in this podcast. So I wanted people to understand, you know, the, the definition that I'm using as opposed to okay. what, other ideas and beliefs. So the next section here, I, I just, I, I call it beliefs, assumptions, and unfalsifiability. So unfortunately for this particular, um, podcast for all, most of the ideas that are going to be shared, we have to operate in this realm. So, you know, if you're, if you're a Christian and believe in, in the Genesis story, uh, rec just recognize that you believe it, right? It, nobody can absolutely positively say this is a fact and nobody ever will be able to do that. Right. And it's the same if you're, you know, materialist or atheist or anything along those lines, and you believe in the big bang idea that nobody's ever going to prove the big bang theory is true never going to happen. They might claim that they can prove it, but nobody could ever prove that this is how things started 13 billion years ago, yabbity, yabbity, yabbadoo. Is that, is that, are you with me on that so far? Sure. And even the most diehard materialist astrophysicists will say, well, what happened before that? Well, I don't know. Yeah. So there's, there's mystery everywhere. The it leads you, only leads you there. Right. The, 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 the People have been blowing holes in the Doppler effect and redshift for, you know, two decades now. It's, it's, they, they try to use that as their, uh, this is proof, you know, redshift of the, of the stars. And it's, it's the, the theories, it's just loaded with assumptions and totally can't be proven. So the re only reason I say that is because a lot of what I talk about today to try to lean us towards this empowering creation story is going to have to be believed for, for somebody who's willing to take on some fresh beliefs, but Ultimately, if you were to stick with 
uh, the direction that we're, that I'm heading in this in this realm, you'll eventually come to see ex and experience for yourself that this is the the correct creation story. So there's a you know a little pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, if you will. Uh, just wanted to kind of make that you know send out that little enticement that if you were to make some changes in your behaviors, your attitudes, uh, you know, the way you think, the way you feel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You could start to see a change in your uh, existence, so to speak. Make sense? Mm -hmm. And I could even suggest that the way this is being presented is not like, you don't have to think about it. The audience doesn't need to listen to it so rigidly as, as if like, here is this, it is presented. Do you believe it or not? Do you immediately replace your current belief with this? That that's not the proposition here. It's like here is something that is being presented. Now just let this sit with you and compare it to your present beliefs and go from there. Right, right. It's a it's a put it into the I don't know folder if you have one such folder in you know filing cabinet in your brain. You know you got I believe this I don't believe that. And hopefully in between there's an I'm not sure folder. Stick it in there. Let it percolate a little bit. Uh, but more importantly. As I've said in many past podcasts, what you what you believe or don't believe, it, it doesn't much matter. Uh, it's what you do. It's how you be that matters. And that's what I'll be driving towards here, hopefully, as I talk about this. So okay. we'll do the materialist story. I just really quickly go over it, of course, that, you know, the idea is that there's, you know, a variety of different ideas. But I think the the leading theory in the Big Bang is that, of course, there was some sort of a black hole in another dimension and all this energy that goes into these gets sucked into these black holes gets you know gets shrunk down to this tiny 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 point and when it gets to this certain degree of energetic potential it explodes out the other side of the black hole and that's the suggestion for how everything we see today uh, is here <laughs> all these all these bouncing billiard ball particles and you know, they come up with the, you know, the the number of years ago that it happened is based on Doppler and Redshift that, that they think that they say that they can accurately uh, uh, detect and experiment with to say that, you know, these certain stars are, you know, we we see the Redshift and that was 13.8 billion years, whatever the numbers are. But that's the basic idea. And of course, from all of this, all these particles and energy coming out of this black hole, everything eventually came back together and planets and stars and hardened and then cooled off. And then all these magical things happened that nobody can reproduce and explain, but eventually water formed and then uh, proteins and uh, amino acids uh, came together with certain chemicals, nitrogen and formed algae. And, and then, uh, then there was us. That's the way it works. So that's all the... based on gravity, right? <laughs> all based on gravity. no graviton ever observed nothing ever observed to be the causer of gravity but all of this is based on gravity <laughs> right and we've talked about that in the past so we won't we won't get into those details the the pond scum and just the, a reminder all that good stuff so that's one story so there's a there's just 80 million assumptions built into this thing uh, none of them can be proven so again there, it's, it's an unfalsifiable story i can't i can't say it's not true but I don't, not my, it's not my, a requirement on me, right? It's required for someone else to say, this is absolutely true. And here's how we know. So that's their story. The, uh, the Christian story, which is, you know, the, the other popular one, at least in the Western world here is, uh, of course, that uh, uh, an entity called God created the earth and the heavens and everything in it in six days and then rested. And that's, of course, all you know, mysteriously accomplished by this mysterious entity. So that's the story. And um, then, of course, there's the Adam and Eve bit. I think maybe I get down to that a little bit here later. So I won't. Yeah, okay. So I won't. Yeah. But then, and then of course, then there's the Adam and Eve story. And that's how you and I and the other 8 billion humans got here. We're all descendants of those two individuals. Okay. Which, of course, strains credulity when we look around the world and see that there's some pretty, you know, pretty significant differences between people from different continents and regions and so forth. Okay, so if you're calling this podcast episode an empowering creation story, you must be suggesting that these two creation stories are disempowering. Is that correct? 
That's a mighty uh, that's astute uh, observation. So the point is, is that the best you can ever do with these two is believe them. Right? And perhaps more importantly. What makes you say that? Because you could never pr prove that they're true. How could you ever prove either okay. one of these stories true? Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. So to your question, right? If you if you take note of, of the stories, right? You are you are helpless in both, right? You're just a random speck of stardust that you know appeared out of the chaos that you'll eventually return to at the time of your death. And between now and then, any random thing could come out of nowhere and put an end to your life, and that's it. Are you applying yeah. that only to the materialist story? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you're you're basically just this uh, tiny little insignificant thing on a blue dot, pale blue dot in space in an infinite universe. Of, com of com you're completely insignificant. Completely insignificant. It's everything's random and chaotic, and uh, there's nothing you can do about the complete and utter randomness and chaos of the universe. You're helpless. Well, I think the metaphysical axiom that leads to that story is feeling of insignificance as a, as its primary and everything is created off that yeah it, you can imagine right it, if from that mindset right if you if you really believe that then there's you know uh you know stealing and robbing and cheating and deceiving and trying to collect up as much material as you can before you die is a perfectly rational way to live your life mm -hmm. right why wouldn't you do that this is it right you got 80 odd years. Uh, let's get survival the most out of it. Survival of the fittest, of, right? Yeah, survival of the fittest. And this is it, right? The, you know, whatever you collect up, maybe you leave some to your your, your children and so forth. But uh, the, the goal every day when you wake up in the morning is to accumulate more stuff. And, you know, whether you hurt someone or steal from someone or cheat someone doesn't matter. What does it matter? You're just going to die. And that's, you know, one day you die and that's it. So, right. I find that the lifestyle of materialism is synced up with the metaphysical belief in materialism. Yeah, it's like I said, you can you you could see how somebody rationalizes their life if this is their if this is the who they think they are, where they think they are and why they're here, right? This is it. You can look around, you know, I want to be a zillionaire. Get as many nice things as I can and do whatever I want and seek uh, the ultimate pleasures in life require money, which I can acquire through any means necessary. I mean, it's really what we're all being taught in, in the standardized government systems, right? Right. And I've been reading Nietzsche's Will to Power recently, which I actually think I'll put down at this point. But, you know, he, he identifies, he's very descriptive as he identifies how, how people are living rather than theorizing. And he, he just observes that the way people are living is this will to power. That's the primary urge to have power over surroundings and environment. Right. That's right. That's exactly right. And and that's what we're being taught, right? That's what we're being taught that. that that's the way to go, right? That's the, if you are going to be labeled a quote unquote success, then this is the, this is the way. There is no other way, <laughs> right? Fight your way to the top. The strongest survives. So that's the, that's where that's where you're at from a materialist point of view. And let I also add that I'm of of the understanding that the uh, cabal uh, that run things teach their children exactly this: that this is it. Hmm. Right. Your job is to get as much money, power, and control as you possibly can in this lifetime, because this is it. It's all over after this lifetime. Hmm. So. They're hardwired to do exactly that. And of course, they don't they don't play fair. Okay. And how about the Christian one? Well, the Christ Christian story, right, of course, just really quickly, is that the this uh, uh, God created the earth in, in ways we can never understand. And, you know, there's, there's some realistic uh, idea. I mean, that's reasonable. But, uh, you know, the and then, of course, and then he creates... 
everything that we see. And then he creates man and woman and man and woman, woman specifically makes a mistake. And this was, has been used against women for thousands of years, right? Eve is the one who makes the error. So the, as the, as you know, the story goes from the esoteric side of things, the, the feminine was dominant prior to this story starting to take hold. And afterwards, the masculine energies took hold. And the, one of the, the linchpin thing that was used for the men, masculine energy to take over was the Adam and Eve story, if you can believe that. They were, women were made to feel guilty, like they screwed up and got us into this mess because of Eve. Mm -hmm. So super duper disempowerment. But here's, you know, even more importantly is this idea, this Christian idea that we're all born sinners. And of course, we have, uh, you know, definition problem here, an interpretation problem with this word sin. But, you know, of course, the popular definition is that you're doing something against God or against God's will. And we have the seven deadly sins and, you know, everybody, everybody's well aware of what's uh, defined as sinful behavior. But perhaps most devastating of all is that there's a, the dominant suggestion in popular Christianity is that you can't help but be a sinner. You're just you, you're just going to have to come to the grips with the fact that you're a sinner and hope that you can, you know, appeal to St. Peter and God and Christ at your, you know, at, at your death and hope that you're, you've, you know, made up for it in other ways. But at the end of the day, mm -hmm. you're, you know, it's up to other entities or beings as to whether or not you get to live for some random unknown period of time which can't possibly be eternity because eternity means forever with no beginning and no ending. Uh, and obviously at the time of your death would be a beginning. And so eternity doesn't really make sense, but yeah, if you, if you didn't do the good things that you were thought you were supposed to do, then you're going to hell for the rest of your life. So you're, you know, not totally helpless in the sense that you can, now that you know what the man tells you the rules are, you can do your best to uh, avoid the pitfalls, but uh, you're going to be judged at your death and highly disempowering, needless to say, uh, because once again, we've got a series of assumptions and beliefs that are unfalsifiable the whole way through. Mm -hmm. It's even assigning the divine spiritual energy to be to be judgmental and for you to be subject to that judgment. Oof, that doesn't sound right. Great. Right. And on one hand, we have an all loving God, and then on the other hand, we have the vengeful judge, judging God. So we, it's like you can't have it both ways. But somehow they do. A lot of them manage to, uh, you know, make in their minds make sense of those two opposing ideas. But needless to say. It, it doesn't add up if you think about it a little bit. But more importantly, even if you think it adds up, it's disempowering. You're you're essentially at the mercy of some other entity that can that has an opinion about you. And, and by the way, you're going to sin your whole life. So just accept it. And you're a lowly sinner. You could never approach living like Jesus or anything else. So that's the idea that dominates. And it, just to be clear, it's you know, for this podcast, it's incredibly disempowering. Uh, I added okay. the uh, Eastern spiritual story here just to, just to suggest that, you know, when we, when we get into Buddhism and Taoism, Confucianism, uh, a lot of the, you know, yogi, yogic, uh, the Hinduism, the Vaita Vedanta, you know, all the different Brahmanism, all the different varieties and India and surrounding countries, right? All of these are heavily focused on reincarnation and karma. And you'll find out here in a second, some interesting little bit of, of information. So that's the kind of the, and, and by the way, that dominates, you know, if the, if you were to take all the world's population, the majority of the world believes in karma and reincarnation. Mm -hmm. And it very much informs how they live. But as you would imagine, it's also there's also a lot of fear, judgment, and disempowerment built into those ideas. And that led to something that happened uh, at the Council of Nicaea for Christianity, a decision that was made, which I'll get to here in a second. So that's the Eastern story. Any, uh, any questions about that? Uh, all good so far. Okay. 
So now I'm going to get to the what I said called the esoteric creation story. It comes from a wide variety of sources. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on any, just briefly, very briefly, touch on a few. Uh, and as I mentioned at the top, you know, it's going to require a little bit of belief or faith from someone who's hearing it for the first time. Uh, and again, we're not saying, yeah, you should just go ahead and believe all this because uh, we said so. But I'm going to try to sum up what I've learned over the past uh, 16 or 17 years into hopefully a coherent uh, finale. So Can I even suggest that it doesn't require any belief or any faith in the beginning, because in the beginning, it's just exposure and awareness of what has been said doesn't doesn't require anything okay, at this point. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. You can just yeah, li what, listen calmly. If you if you find it interesting, <laughs> I will say at the end, uh, after you contemplate it for a bit, uh, I, I can't prove anything is why I wrote that bullet point, right? I can't prove any one of these things to you any more mm -hmm. than somebody can prove the Big Bang thing or, or the uh, you know Genesis creation story. It's unprovable. So one of the first notes I wanted to make is in, in you know, mainstream history that we've been taught is mostly false. <laughs> the further back you go, the, the more false it is. And I think I, you know, I told Matt, we could, we could run a, you know, a whole podcast channel that did nothing but uh, poke tolls and tore up uh, what we've been taught about history. So if that uh, comes as a shock, then it comes as a shock to somebody who's listening. But I mean, it's it, it, almost nothing we've been taught about history is true. It's a, it's actually astonishing when you go back and look at it. So, you know, what informs my opinion here? I, I, I'll, I'll say that a lot of channeled materials have uh, have uh, informed my opinion, and I've listened to a, a lot of different sources, and I try to do my best to discern, uh, you know, the stuff that's a little more realistic than others, uh, and I'll kind of get into that here in a little bit. Uh, also, you know, conspiracy theory stories, there's a lot of them out there, and they also blend with the, some of the channeled materials. A lot of people have uh, heard the story about the Anunnaki and Anu and that there was this, uh, you know, planet X that comes around, you know, orbits in a different way and it floats around the earth every couple thousand of years. I, I don't remember all the details, but there was this, uh, there was this alien species that came down here and wanted the gold on the planet. And so they mixed some of their genetics with the, the, the apes of earth and produced a, a slave race to gold mine for them. Uh, I think you'll Yikes. get this out. Zachariah Sitchin stuff is very popular the, this, with this Anunnaki thing. This is, and it comes from some Sumerian tablets and on and on. So that's, you know, that's one idea. Uh, you also hear this from, from uh, channeled sources as well, that, that like groups like the, what's no, what are known as the Pleiadians and the Syrians and other, uh, we'll, we'll call them galactic civilizations, did something similar, not for nefarious purposes, but rather for uh, a different type of experience. So there was some blending of other species and uh, with species that were living here. And, you know, that's why the, that's the whole chromosome thing, right? Where humans have two less chromosomes than primates and, you know, on and on and on. Uh, but all I want to say about all this is I, I'm aware of all these stories, but they're really, in my opinion, they're not that important, whether they're true or not. Uh, and I'll get to exactly what I mean here briefly. But those are some common things. So there's Helena Blavatsky, which everybody, you know, she's uh, on the list of uh, evil because, you know, the, the Theosophical Society was infiltrated by dark magicians and on and on and on. And so the whole thing, you can you can wipe the whole thing off the map just because Aleister Crowley was involved, right? <laughs> that's That's the way it works, right? Like, Everything she said was wrong because this, you know, the most evil man in the world was got, you know, was was involved in the Golden Dawn and so forth. And there were some other Ledbetter and some other ones that were up to no good. Uh, but so Blavatsky and Steiner, Steiner, just to say what I wanted to say earlier about Rudolf Steiner was that he had suggested that it was during the Council of Nicaea and he uses his, you know, his uh, psychic visions. He says that. They, there was a decision to leave reincarnation out of the Bible because it was causing so many problems in the other uh, religious traditions. They were It was too heavily weighed upon, and it, it, it became this tool of abuse and to control people by, uh, you know, telling them they'd become a, you know, a slug at the next lifetime if they did this, that, or the other. So interesting, right? I've only ever heard that from Steiner. So it's an interesting uh, side note I wanted to make. 
that it's a, it's a common mm-hmm. argument is that reincarnation isn't in the Bible. So it doesn't, it does not, right? It doesn't say anything about it. So most Christians think that it can't be true because it's not in the Bible. So it doesn't say it's not true, right? Some people say there are parts of the Bible scripture that have been removed, and there's a few examples of that out there. But again, I don't think it's that important. Uh, now, of course, along the lines with Steiner is this antediluvian period and the vapor canopy idea, which I think is pretty accurate. So Steiner talks about, believe it or not, and this is really interesting, is that at one time, the sun and the moon were part, and the earth were all one entity, one object. The sun, the moon, and the earth were all one object, one entity. Okay. That's right. Well, he'll talk about the old sun and the old moon, the new sun and the new moon. Of course, we see what he would call the new sun and the new moon today. But they were once part of the earth, and they removed themselves. Now, he su- would suggest that the fall of man or the fall from grace was the removal of the sun, as you know, that took that the, all that light away to leave the earth in, in darkness, if you will. And this is also the same idea with the vapor canopy and the move, the movement in the the Atlantean period, which goes with the uh, the Noah flood or the Gilgamesh flood and the Sumerian tablets. Right? There's a lot of different traditions that talk about the flood, but the idea was is that back, and I've talked about this before, way back before when the sun and moon were part of the earth, the earth was like covered in a fog or a mist, and that's what it, it just that's it was like that 24 by 7. There was no sun and no moon like we know it today. Everything was misty. You, and Steiner has said, you, you know, imagine looking at streetlights on a real foggy night, right? And that's, he said, that's kind of what it looked like back then. But something happened, and he suggests that this the sun, or, you know, this energy moved away from the earth. And that caused the vapor, it caused this misty world to cause all that mist to collapse, right? And basically turn into water. And people will call this the, the vapor canopy event which goes pretty nicely with all these flood stories. So you can imagine if the earth was completely, you know, enveloped in, in moisture in the air, right? And if that all came down to earth, it would, everything would be a lot wetter. <laughs> so, so, so far I'm hearing like, okay, you've got the sun, the moon, the earth were all one object. And then, then we've got, okay, the earth had a vapor canopy and it condensed and all water came down. Uh, so do you want to, begin to kind of tie. Well, that, I mean, that goes with the flood story, right? So then we have the, you know, the Christian version, of course, is that man became so evil that God had to wipe man out. So they, a giant flood was cast upon the earth, uh, right? Did, did you hear my full question there? Or I just had an internet connection stability problem. Maybe not. Please repeat. Uh, I, I was ask, asking like, okay, you've given these two ideas, right? And then I was asking, are, are you kind of like sprinkling multiple ideas to kind of like lay a, lay a framework to connect all together? Or, or are these, are these two directly linked in the creation story? Which two? Uh, okay. You've got the sun, the moon and the earth being one object. And then you've got, okay, that's one. And then you've got the, uh, vapor canopy and that condensed and formed water on the earth. These two. Well, they, they, those are totally connected, right? So I, I was, I, I thought I said that. So Steiner was suggesting that when the sun moved away from the earth, right, this vapor canopy collapsed, that the misty, foggy atmosphere that everybody was in went away. Is that not clear? Okay, sure. So yeah, that's, and so you have the flood story in the Bible, which most people know, which, which most people don't know is that before that story that the Sumerians had it in their tablets. And that was the tale of Gilgamesh, I think is what it's called. But it's, you know, virtually the same story. Humanity was effectively wiped out by this uh, giant flood. So it, it appears mm-hmm. like, like that this really did happen, right? So that's why I say there's some truth and untruth and, you know, things that get mixed together. Uh, I'm going to jump past G just because I decided to jump past G. Uh and I think I might jump past H as well. But so here's what, I, here's what I wanted to try to get across to people is that there's all of these ideas that are floating around out there that many people are aware of are all about based on like physicalness, right? So there isn't, there isn't the, anything about really the more important aspects of things 
which are, you know, the, the metaphysical or the spiritual aspects. So, but I just wanted to kind of go through some of these dominant esoteric and conspiracy theory stories just to give them their, you know, their two cents, right? Like, okay, I'm aware of these, you know, we, we can believe them or not believe them. Uh, but where does it get us in the end? I'm, we're trying to get to empowerment and these things just leave us with another belief system if we want to believe them. Sure. Yeah? Sure. Kind of like a, f like fragmented, you know, idea that you can believe in. Right. That doesn't lead you towards something like a full picture, right? Right. And it's like, now that I know this, all right, I know this. And, you know, so I, you know, so if you believe the Anunnaki story, then you're on a slave's planet and things are horrible and the bad guys are in charge and it's awful. If you believe the Pleiadian Syrian story, then people, people who believe those stories uh, tend to, it doesn't feel, they don't feel like they're at home here on earth, right? They're uncomfortable. They want to leave. They want to get out of here. So there's, you know, this, that's the kind of thing that uh, it, it uh, inspires in people to believe those types of stories. Right. So, you, you know, you're just kind of left with still this kind of helpless, powerless, I don't know what to do and I don't want to be here and I don't like this. And, and so all these kind of leave you in that space. I get, and actually, I will do the hidden hand. I'm just going to touch the hidden hand and raw material. So what they're suggesting, and I'm not going to get into any details here. Matt and I will do a, a full podcast on these subjects later if people are curious or interested. But what I got from this hidden hand, you know, Illuminati insider story and from the raw material, which shortly followed after that, was a, a kind of a new idea. And the new idea was that we wanted to come down here and participate in this world of material, physical life. So each and every one of us chose to come down here. And in that process, and Steiner's in agreement with this too, in that process, we have forgotten that that's what we did. And we're so deeply in a state of ignorance right now that working our way back out of it is the big challenge. And the reason it's hard to work our way back out of it is because we believe all these different stories that are obviously promulgated by the mainstream that hold us in abeyance, right? Hold us in disempowerment, hold us in belief systems. And whichever one we go with, the suggestion is, is that we're just going to keep reincarnating to discharge our karma forevermore. That, in other words, that's what the, the idea that somebody else, there's a, there are other powers here that are in control of things are keeping us trapped because we don't know what the heck's going on. All right. And I've, I've told Matt this before. There have been four or five, three or four other Illuminati insider uh exposés, disclosures over the last 25 odd years in various places. And they all kind of have that in common. Some of the some of the the people that did these on, you know, on the conspiracy theory forums were pretty rude. Uh, others like Hidden Hand were friendly. Uh, so it's interesting to see the contrast there. But they all kind of had this in common. Uh, is that they 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 would kind of you know most of them were kind of laughing at us like you just you you can't even well, basically what the, the what they suggest is, is every few years so they're required by divine law to speak to us plebes right us slaves and they're they're required to truthfully and honestly answer our questions for a couple of days and they so they show up on these forums and start answering questions and. You know, the kind of the similarity between all of these is that, you know, the questions are, you know, kind of trivial questions and they keep telling you, you're, you're asking dumb questions. These don't really matter. You got to get to the, you got to get to the good stuff. You know, what, why are you here? Where are you? You know, what are you? Who are you? What's going on? You know, these kind of questions is what they are suggesting that we ask them and answer. And you know, got quite a few different interesting answers in, out there, but basically that was the, the thrust of all of these was that you're, you're all, you, you know, you're either scared about the, you know, the powers that are in control or you're scared about your religious beliefs or you're just running around uh, living life so frivolously that you're going to miss the boat completely. And to me, that, that struck me as some of the most interesting material I'd ever read. Mm -hmm. And that's why I included here because I thought, well, all right, you know, where am I? Yeah, okay, I believe a lot of things about where am I? Who am I? Well, I believe a lot of things about who I am and why am I here? You know, it's, these are all good questions. So 
what was the what what the suggestion is i think you know if i can bring this to uh, a final point was that if all we really need to do is ask you know let's say ask your inner being your higher self your soul your spirit jesus god what whatever you you think of as this higher power is to begin asking these types of questions and you'll be led to information people material videos whatever that will start pointing you in the correct the path that you should be uh, taking if you want to get out of this world of suffering strife pain struggle hatred violence fear etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. right make sense yeah if i can add something um you know with the uh materialist story and the christian exoteric story it's like when you when you for, for me personally I don't, I don't know about for everyone else but like for me personally at least when i pursue the metaphysical ponderings and direct and and take that as a kind of thing to believe in and you know start spinning my head around in that it doesn't really lead me toward less suffering right it doesn't really resolve my concerns at all right but i find that when i whether whether this stuff that you're talking about is the the truth of everything or whether it's like metaphor or something like that but i find that when i project this material upon this conceptual material upon my experience that it makes sense of things and it actually relates to what i'm noticing mm -hmm. and helps me uh stitch together fragmented confusions you know to make sense of things yeah and things actually resolve i go oh okay okay oh yeah i can look at it in that way oh yeah okay that's that's better and it i, I find it actually has that central calming effect that i think most people are like internally looking for whether you, whether or not you can give it a name or that but you're like uh there's this meta there's this metaphysical angst that i'm trying to resolve and this resolves it <laughs> to some extent at least right so right. far yeah yeah I, and you know everybody's so different right we we have a totally different past and we have our own different hang-ups and issues and questions and so it's it's really hard to say just just go right straight here and here, that's all you need right it's, it'd be kind of nice there's actually is one way they call it the direct path but most people well, aren't going to do it for reasons I'm not going to talk about here today. Um, but yeah, you, if you begin to ponder, contemplate, consider, investigate this type of material, it starts to create some openings, which I think is what you're expressing there. Right, right, yeah. It, so, it relieves the constriction, the contraction, and right. just opens up. Like it opens up the body, it opens up the mind, it deletes the contradictions, it just... Ah, it's, you know, that's it's it leads toward that nirvana, right? That sigh of relief. That ah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it's exactly exactly right. And and it's very hard to do that if you cling to the mainstream beliefs, right? You mm -hmm. can't get that opening because you're you're you know the foundation that your belief system is built on. Uh, you you hold so tightly to it that. Uh, you can't get those types of uh, releases that you're talking about. Right. It just isn't and there. I mean, it could even be that it's, it's because, it, you know, when I go into this stuff, like I'm not believing it, right? Like I'm just aware of it. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. It really relates to what I'm experiencing. I don't believe it. But at the same time, whenever, whenever I explore it and uh, allow that as a possibility to be true, I'm also... um deleting out firm beliefs that i've already had right so it's possible that just that like the deletion of the beliefs about the mainstream stuff that i've been clinging to it's possible that it just does that work and just removes the beliefs yeah and it does. that's the that allows for the expansion and it's not even something you have to actively do the way you're expressing that as well right it just kind of happens like that's weird right it's like oh mm -hmm. i don't know i don't know what happened but somehow i feel better about this situation or whatever right it's just it just kind of mm -hmm. Un, uh, you know, 
un loosens up a block or something. So you can't always say, in order to fix your money problems, you just need to release these blocks, right? In order to fix your relationship problems, I mean, it'd be nice if it were that easy, uh, but it's not. It's it's really, you know, what you're really pointing to, if I may sum up, is that you're saying you've gone from I know to I don't know. And that may be one of the most liberating places you can get to, even though society tells you otherwise. Did oh, yeah. That? I mean, oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's so liberating and empowering to let go, to, to, to notice that the beliefs you've held were just based on some figure in society said it was like that. And to realize right. that, that the very basis of their statement were illogical axioms or mm -hmm. unconfirmed observations and then go, ah, right. that's silly. These experts don't know as much as they say they do, do they? <laughs> yeah, that, that's it. And, and maybe that's what, what I'm aiming for ultimately in, in this, uh, in this podcast is to, you know, lighten up, loosen up or allow the possibility that you don't know that the experts that told you they knew they don't know. And it's okay for you to not know as well, right? It's okay to not know exactly how this all works and what, what it means and so forth. But there are some things that are good to know as well. Maybe I'll get to those here in a few minutes. But yeah, that's a good- uh, I'll add in something just a little bit freaky deaky, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, this, in, this idea of like presenting, you know, just a an, a, a creation story that, lead, that helps you get to a point from, huh, I guess it is, kind of, I don't know. I, I don't know, right? You know, people- uh, you know, this top subject of like Scientology and L. Ron Hubbard, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People think that um, all the Scientologists believe that there is this planet or an alien race of Xenu or something like that. And they came and <laughs> dumped souls into volcanoes and whatever. I don't, I don't literally, I don't know what it is, right? But some like ridiculous story and people think, oh, these Scientologists, they're, they're insane, right? They believe this nonsense, Okay. But I've actually listened to the to the clip where L. Ron Hubbard is telling that story, right, to people in his group. Mm -hmm. And the way it sounds is that he's telling them this like, oh, yeah, and then well, this happened, and then this happened. And it gets the feeling that he's telling them a completely arbitrary creation story. And like, yeah, well, you know, it could be anything, right? It's just so, take, for example, this silly thing. And you can see how that works out. I so, see. Yeah. Okay. I yeah. think that the point of that idea is to just present an absurd. He was just presenting an absurd story to just make the point that, oh, this creation story is like, you really don't know what's happening. Now, that's just my reading of it. I suggest someone go listen to it and see if what I'm saying is true or not. Yeah, I don't, I don't know anything about it, so I'll take your word for it. But yeah, that's that could be right. I mean, you know, some of the stuff he did was interesting. Obviously, where it's at today is a whole different ball game, right? And but we can, we can point to every type of group that started out, uh, and it eventually led to, you know, a corrupted, inverted, twisted version of what the founder had in mind, right? Um. I just spoke of, you know, theosophy and Blavatsky, right? How that went nowhere. And frankly, the uh, anthroposophical society of Steiner and his Waldorf schools are not even, not even a fragment of what he intended or envisioned for those. So there you go. Just another example of that, right? Mm -hmm. When humans form groups, the groups become inverted and corrupted and twisted. That's just, there's no two ways around it. There's no, I can't think of an example. I can't think of an exception to that rule. So that's where we are, but good, uh, good observation. So I wanted to do this next section, truths and parallels, just, just to, you know, uh, su I suggested this at the top, right? So, you know, the something from nothing idea has some validity, right? You know, if you believe any of the metaphysical uh, teachings, of course, is that material stuff is temporary and, and ephemeral, right? That it, and we, we see that in our own experience, right? Things come and go. Nothing is permanent. So the idea that uh, at one time there was no, nothing or no things, and then some things ar arose from those no things does have some validity if you, if you, you know, from the Big Bang idea, right? 
Now, whether they whether all things arrived after a single singular explosion, right, that's another matter. Uh, I, I don't think that there's uh, any truth to that in the sense that we think of it in linear time, like everything was created 13.8 billion years ago. Uh, nothing, nothing's been added or removed ever since. Uh, that part of it uh, is uh, undeniable. Well, incorrect from a metaphysical standpoint. Likewise, uh, you know, a lot of what's in the Bible, there is a, a tremendous amount of truth in the Bible um, when read in, in a certain way, uh, allegorically, metaphorically, uh, as parable, right? So when the, when, when the stories and the characters and, and the historical events are taken to be, you know, true and real linear secular history, that's when uh, it, the Bible becomes difficult, if not impossible, to accept. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the Garden of Eden story is one I like to tell. I think it, it resonates with a lot of people, even if they don't like what I'm saying, they hear it. And that's, of course, the Adam and Eve story. Um, and, you know, the story is that, that God puts Adam to sleep, takes one of his ribs and creates Eve out of the rib. So, you know, if you just stop and slow down and think about that story for a little bit, you know, if, if God was able to create Adam out of the ethers, why would, couldn't he create Eve out of the ethers, right? Why would he need to take one of Adam's ribs, uh, right? That, that, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. And the key part of that story though, is, um, is that this, as the scripture says, God put Adam to sleep, but he never says, it never says that he woke him back up. And that may be the most important thing I say in this podcast is to suggest that humanity, by and large, in what we call waking consciousness, is actually asleep to the greater truths of the universe. Any comment? Well, I think that's definitely true. <laughs> <laughs> right? I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the greater truths are, but the insanity, like the insanity, the absurdity of how things are set up right now, could not point to anything other than all our most fundamental beliefs are right. totally askew. Right. Yeah. If you look at societal. Uh, behavior and, and so forth, uh, you can see that something something is amiss out there. And the suggestion is, of course, from, we'll say, es esoteric and metaphysical sources, that we've allowed ourselves to be lowered into this state of ignorance over many, many millennia. And uh, we see the results, you know, the Indian side of things, call it Kali Yuga, is, is where the furthest from the source energy, if you will. And what's happening now, the exciting news is that what's happening now is we're in the full-on reversal of this state of ignorance and, and the unconsciousness and asleepness. So I think that's a pretty interesting uh, thing to say. Uh, I'll just say this last thing about the Bible is that it's also been suggested by several Christian mystics that I've enjoyed uh, studying over the years that, you know, the, the, the people uh, in the Bible specifically are represent states of being. So rather than, than, and not all the people, but let's say many of the characters in the Bible are, it's a, it's a metaphorical story and they're meant to represent certain states of being. And as well, we have many things that we, that are called states, right? We have the state of Israel, we have, uh, you know, Egypt, which is a state or a nation. Right. And in the Bible, right, these were these were uh, considered what they really meant by an Israelite or a Judean or an Egyptian was that the Israelite or Judean was just somebody who was awake. And the Egyptian or the Sodomite was somebody who was asleep. Had nothing mm -hmm. to do had nothing to do with geography or region or location or that you were born into the right bloodline or any of that. It had nothing to do with it. You're either awake or you're asleep. And that's what, that was the differences, you know? And then of course those got turned into geographical regions, right? Or tribes. And, you know, the, 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 those places weren't called Israel 
or Judea or anything like that, right? It was, those were named long after. Same with Egypt, right? That's a, that word was used, was created to name that region long after the scripture was written. That was called Kemet back in those days, all of that region. So there's a little food for thought for everybody uh, is that that's right. And so we're all fighting over what these words mean and who, who are the chosen people and on and on and on. And here, all it, all it meant was asleep or awake. Are you asleep or are you awake? And this is why Jesus walked around saying, you know, for, only for those with eyes to see and ears to hear. That's what he meant. If you're awake, you're going to understand what I'm saying. If you're asleep, you're not going to understand what I'm saying. That's what he was saying. Mm -hmm. All right. So NDEs, I, this has been something that I found fascinating here just in the last, really in the last year. Uh, I've, I mean, I've known about near-death experiences, NDEs, for quite some time, but it was always this kind of, uh, you know, little side interest, you know, I was curious, but there's just been an explosion of stories out there. And it's, it's like people, historically, I think people who told their near-death experience stories were, uh, uh, you know, considered a little wacky or they were just, you know, it was a hallucinating in, in the, you know, in the past, you know, 20, 50, 100 years ago, and people just learned to be quiet about them. They didn't, you know, they didn't want to ruffle any feathers. And of course, their stories, right, contradict classic materialism and Christianity. So effectively, the NDE was offending both of the dominant creation stories or belief systems, whatever you want to call them. But mm -hmm. now, I mean, now there's, there, I'm not kidding. There, I think there are five or six channels on YouTube that are do nothing but interview people with near death experience stories. And I'm not, you know, I'm not going to get into all the details, uh, but you know, it, it, it's, it's, you know, maybe one or two people are lying out of every hundred or something. Who knows? Right? They're making it up. They want attention. Whatever. Sure, sure, sure. Maybe that's happening. But after you, you know, you you can watch and see for yourself and listen to these people, and you can see. You just go, oh, there's no way this person's lying. You couldn't make up some of this stuff, right? It just, it's so, you know, beyond our experience. But just to be, to tie it into tonight's podcast, what I want to say about this is that all of them, almost all of them without fail, say that they met up with another being, whether it's an angel or a spirit guide or Jesus or Krishna or Buddha, you know, depending on what their belief system is. And they're given a choice, right? They're saying you chose to come down here and play out this lifetime of yours. And, you know, you wanted to do this and this and this, but you, if you, if you want, you can choose to die and end all that, or you can go back and finish up what you plan to do. And obviously these people that have these NDEs for, you know, various reasons, children, spouses, uh, career paths, whatever it is that they wanted to do, they choose to come back. And, you know, they're told, you know, you're going to have a, you know, a year or five years of rehab and you're going to be in pain and they still want to come back. So that's the, probably one of the most interesting threads about these NDEs is that they're, these people are told you, you wanted to have this experience. You chose, you knew you were going to come down here and forget the real world, right? You were going to forget who you really were and you were going to come down into this realm called life on earth and have this experience of effectively duality, opposites, right? Pain and pleasure, good and evil, right and wrong, left and right. So, and you know, a lot of these people, I'll let you hear your impressions here in a second, but a lot of these people were admitted, you know, atheists prior to their near-death experience. And, you know, lastly, you know, what they all come back and say is that, that Really, this whole life is about love, is what they all come back and say. Whether you're an atheist, a Christian, a Buddhist, a Hindu, it doesn't matter. They say, that's what I learned while I was, you know, in between life and death. So I'm supposed to just come down here, have fun, be do stuff I love, you know, be kind to people, and, you know, kind of all the stuff that you get out of most uh, basic religious texts. So, really interesting. And I'm telling you, there are thousands and thousands of stories free on YouTube now for anybody who's curious. You can find these channels and give it a listen. See what you think. There's a lot more interesting stuff going on there, but that's what's relevant to tonight's uh, podcast. What do you think, Matt? Uh, it seems like just the newer stuff that I'm being exposed to regarding creation is points to more love, less fear, less judgment. That's and I that's feel a like simple the way to old up. stories. 
point to the materialist story points to fear and the Christian exoteric biblical story points to judgment. Yeah. And you're warned time and time again to avoid those two things, <laughs> right? Jesus's greatest commandment, love God with all your heart, mind, and soul and love thy neighbor as thyself. And who's your neighbor? It's everybody else. <laughs> Right? Yeah, and I, mean, I should clarify because it, it definitely says, you know, in, in the Bible, it says, you know, don't judge. It definitely says that. And it definitely says love and don't be afraid. It definitely says those things. But I find that there's still something missing from it. Like it doesn't, um, it, it, it's just the fact that it's all uh, wait until death and then you'll be judged kind of thing. I, th I think there's something missing in life. Yeah. Well, that. the, Accepting the popular interpretation of it doesn't prevent anybody from being in fear and judgment, right? Yeah, it's the interpretation, yeah, that, that I think is off. Like, what, I think what we're talking here is not the Bible itself, but the, the interpretation of that, how people are running with that. Right. And, you know, perhaps more importantly is that they, while few might admit it, you know, I mean, there's obviously, there's different ways people live uh in uh the world but you know all of them by you know the fear of disease and you know evil politicians and horrible bad people and you know and there's fear and judgment you know wrapped up in every aspect of life including mm -hmm. listening to a lot of ministers give a sermon on sunday right when they like to talk about the devil and so forth so, but yeah, I just wanted to see what you thought about this NDE idea, right? And there's a lot more to them, right? There's quite a bit more that is very, very interesting, but just tying that basic sense that instead of the banging particles from a big bang that somehow you somehow came up from an algae and became, now you're this, right? There's that idea, or there's this idea that something else created you and you're at the mercy of that something else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're, you've got to behave a certain way and believe a certain belief system or you're doomed. Incredibly frightening, fear, fearful, disempowering. And, you know, perhaps even more importantly than all of those things is that if you really, really believe that, then anybody who doesn't believe what you believe, you're judging extensively, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's just, you know, it's both of them wrapped up in one when you go with that you know, mainstream interpretation. But these NDEs, it's like they're saying, no, you, you this is your choice. You, you're the one who wanted to come down here and do this thing, uh, right? You can you can come back to, they all talk, as soon as they die, right? As soon as the accident happens or they drown or whatever, it's like they all say it was like instantaneous bliss and infinite love and you, you know, colors were vibrant and it was the most wonderful place I'd ever been, right? It's like all of them say this, right? And it's like, I didn't want to go back. And I just, I was so happy to be here. And I felt like I was back and home. And then, you know, they're saying it, it's indescribable how wonderful this is. And yet they all chose to come back, at least, you know, the survivors, right? Of an NDE. They all chose to come back into this game of life in order to mm -hmm. finish off what they started. So pretty doggone interesting. I'm just going to say it out loud. So could it be, right? Could it be that you chose to be here and you're happy to be here? It could be. <laughs> right? This this part of you, you know, as some will call it, this larger part of you chose this. And this uh, this part of you that's a, it's a little bit in the sleepy zone, right? Struggles with a little bit of life, uh, has some, you know, some problems. You suffer a little bit, maybe some pain. Uh, you know, maybe that's all a little bit part of it. And the way we react to life's difficulties could be softened in certain ways that uh, might not make them so painful. You know, there's an interesting, uh, one of the teachers out there says something interesting. I always like to repeat it is, how could you know what you do want if you don't already know what you don't want? <laughs> right? If you didn't know what you didn't want, then you, you wouldn't want anything either. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So that's this is this idea of contrast or catalyst. Anyway. Right. So what do I leave this at? Mass you thought creates reality. Ah, mass, right. So all of us together, right, create the suggestion is that all of us together collectively with all our consciousness, so all that we're energy that we're putting out, right? Some of us are putting out love and kindness and, and you know, charity and gratitude most of the time. Some of the time, some of us are putting out hatred and fear and judgment and anger and blame. And right? it's this whole mass mixture of all our energies is what we see right out there in the world. So you can you can create an individual reality for yourself that avoids all the neg negativity. Of course, it's, again, as I said at the top, it's important what, what you're thinking is just, a, just as important as what you're doing. So the, the thoughts and feelings and so forth are helping to generate your experience. And this creation story, rather than this linear idea of it all started 13.8 billion years ago or some 5,000 years ago or whatever, that idea uh, gets replaced by creating. So there's no such thing as creation as we know it. All there is is creating and it's going on constantly. Mm -hmm. There's no beginning. There's no end. There's no finished product. Like living is creating. Living is creating. They're synonymous. And you have the power to create anew. If that's true, right? You're not stuck in the place you're in because the last 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years means you're stuck. Mm -hmm. But you can believe, you can use your power to believe that you're stuck. And then you're going to experience being stuck. Yeah. Mm hmm. So we have these forces out there called media, propaganda, and organized religion, public education that are all working overtime. And I do mean overtime to convince you that you, you're helpless, powerless, you're a victim, you're trapped, you're stuck, and there's not much you can do. So it's me and Matt or me against that <laughs> gigantic machine of information out there. This is one of those things that you kind of have to take into your center of your being, into your heart, and let it percolate for a while. So I was closing with this, just this simple idea that if you can take this on, as Matt rightly corrected me earlier and pointed out, you don't have to believe this, right, or accept any of what I just said. Um but you can file it in the to be considered filing cabinet. What I'm suggesting to as you progress, if you choose to do that and progress in that direction, then you'll begin to learn things that will alter your perception of reality for the better, cause you to change some of your attitudes, behaviors, and beliefs for the better. And thusly, your experience of life should also improve. And that that's health, wealth, relationships, careers, whatever you deem important, you should see improvements in. So you'll get to a point when you'll go beyond believing whether I said is true or not. You'll know it through your experience. Mm -hmm. That's my final word. Any comments? I would say that, let's say that half, just approximately, right? Half the world's materialist and half the world's more Christian, like uh, creation-oriented story, right? Well, the Western world, okay. Just a guess. I'll, I'll, I'll go with you on that. Western world, yeah, okay, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. And, uh, yeah, if, uh, you know, like you're, you're born into this, right? You're born, you're raised... You go to school, you hear the media, you hear, hear your parents talk. Everyone says this stuff, right? And basically believe it. 
And you think it's true. You don't think you believe it. You think you know it because you have all these reasons why you know it. Not that you've ever observed it. Not that you've ever experienced, you know, you didn't watch creation right? you didn't see the big bang. You didn't see God create the earth, but you, you know, but that's what you believe. That's the story. And you got a billion or multiple billions of other people and they believe it too. And all the experts, they say it and they have very smooth voices. They speak much more smoothly than I do or that Brad does. I mean, you listen to Neil deGrasse Tyson and he's so certain and so smooth, right? Whereas Brad and I are like, uh, and then, uh, what well, you know, kind of like this, right? So it sounds much more convincing to hear from the experts of the groups with billions of people. Uh, and all I suggest is just take one moment to just go, what if it's not like that? Okay. Just what if it's not like that? Right. And, and what's important to what Matt just said there is that you can find out and I'll, I'll, maybe I'll leave you with this thought. Maybe you can comment on this. What if it's just a, what if I'm not saying this is true or not true, but what if what is true is only and ever what you believe is true. Imagine the possibilities if that were the case. The infinite possibilities, I might add. Did you hear that? Did I hear it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I've heard it. I mean, we've discussed it. I think the the interesting thing that that raises is a reobservation, a reanalysis of, wait, wait, I've been running with this word true. <laughs> well, I think it means something. Hold on, hold on. What does this word actually point at? Because <laughs> yeah. like, I always thought it meant this, that, and the other. But, whoa, hold on. What does it mean for something to be true? Right. That's a good observation. Right? When people hear that for the first time, or ideas similar to that, right, they might say, well, if that's true, then I believe I'm a billionaire and I have seven Ferraris and you know a mansion on every continent on the beach, and I can fly. And, you know, they uh, get up the next morning and, and none of those things are true. And they say, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, that's not true. Because I don't have any of those things. And uh, it's a little little more complicated, right? There's a There are about 58,000 beliefs between where you're at now and <laughs> being able to fly over buildings or be a, a billionaire or have, you know, 10 Ferraris. Right? There's a couple of other things that are in the way there. Um but, and it's a process, right, to work through those uh, beliefs that are in the way. But that's right. the suggestion that's out there, getting more and more popular, you know, spreading, no idea is spreading more than that today. That I can assure you. Is it hard to believe? It, well, yeah, especially if you're in a tough spot, right? If, if life is, you've had a difficult life and you've struggled, it's a tough thing. Uh, but try it on. And obviously, work on something that's realistic that you don't like about your life, right? Realistic. Uh, you know, if you want a complete nutter overhaul of your physical appearance, that's probably a little unrealistic uh, right off the bat. But softening and easing your view of yourself and thinking of things in a more loving way and treating yourself better may lead you to some surprising results rather than trying to look like a, a runway model after uh, one day of hoping you look like a runway model or having, you know, a hundred thousand dollars in debt versus having a million in the bank, right? It's a big jump to go from one to the other. But there mm -hmm. is a poss possibility that uh, you can ease your way out of that in ways that you did you can't imagine at the moment. If you're, you know, mm -hmm. have a death grip death grip on your biggest problems in life. But that's a subject bigger subject for another time. And this is just really you know this podcast was to seed the idea out there that you can continue on with your disempowered disempowering creation stories and you know the results will be the results uh, there's not much you can do uh, you can try to do your best and hope for the best or you can take active 
control of things and recognize that creation is an ongoing process and it starts with you. So that's your, like, I, I know we went on a, a kind of, uh, we turned it this way and that way and explored a lot of different tangents here, but it seems that the conclusion of the story of the creation story is that creation is happening, not happened, right? That, that, would you say that's the main conclusion of the story? Yes, precisely. And it's going right. to continue happening forevermore. And that in itself is empowering because if creation's already happened, then, well, what can you do, right? Yeah. <laughs> But exactly. if creation is now and you are a part of it, or you are it, then you are creating and you are powerful. Creation is, if cre if life is creation and creation is power almost, right? Yeah, it's, very, very good it. observation. Right. And, and rather than try to take that on as I'm going to fix the world, you know, I want to end world hunger if I'm this powerful, uh, recognize that this creation, creating story while you can influence others around you, it, it relates to your direct experience specifically. Mm -hmm. And if you want to fix the world, as we've said many times before, you start by fixing yourself. Right. So you are axiomatically powerful, all right? You don't need to go through any creation. You know, you don't need to conclude based on materialism or um, the Bible that you are powerful in this story, you're axiomatically powerful. Exactly. In your particular orbit, you are all powerful and you can believe it. You can disbelieve it or you can make some changes and see what your experience brings you. And you would easily can uh, believe or agree that you you have the power right now to cr you know make your lunch, or make your breakfast, right? Right. It's, it, and it seems to depend on what what the you know what what's the scope or what's the power of your belief to believe what you could do right now. That depends on whether you'll do it, right? And and can do it. And the idea of, of you know, I, I should be able to fly over skyscrapers if this is true, right? It's, it's too big of a shift in your present belief system. Or I want a billion dollars in my bank account. It's too big of a shift, too big a change. It's not impossible, but it's too big a change. But you can make incremental changes. And you start with the simple things in life. But that's, you know, another podcast, another time. We'll talk about that a lot more. And that's part of the Take Your Power Back course. We get into this these ideas as well, but it's, uh, it's, this is, again, this podcast was just to seed the idea. These are your three choices. You're insignificant. You're mostly powerless or you're powerful. You take your pick, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Had I been given those choices at five years old, I can, I can, uh, imagine almost all of us would have chosen the last of the three given those options, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just a matter of 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years of holding on to this particular belief system that makes it so hard to release, but it can be done. It's just a choice. So yeah, that's, uh, that, that's part of the take your power back course. And, you know, there are elements of this in there and really it's, uh, it, that's the, the essence of most of our podcasts is getting people uh, to consider these ideas. And this is just another, uh, you know, episode that can help lean people in that direction if they're curious and open some new vistas in their lives. Because let's face it, you know, the human condition without question is we're all seeking this uh, state of happiness and we can never quite totally 100% get there, can we? We're always, can always improve upon something. Our health, our wealth, our relationships, our career, our you know family, whatever it is, we're all 
reaching out to improve upon these areas. So the Take Your Power Back uh, course can help you with all of those. What do you say, Matt? Sounds great. Well, all right. That's all I got. Anything else uh, on your end? Nope. Very nice conclusion. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for uh, listening in to another podcast episode. Uh, Take your power back. And we look forward to uh, your feedback, comments, and uh, we'll uh, see you in the next episode. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Brett. Thanks, everyone. See you next time.